Welcome, folks. This is Mark Steiner right here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. Today in the studio, we have somebody who's, uh, full disclaimer, been a, long, a friend for a long, long, long time, uh, Paul Coates. Paul Coates is the founder of Black Classic Press. Uh, he is a businessman here in the city. Uh, he was back in the 60s and early 70s defense captain for the Black Panther Party here in Baltimore. But uh, sometimes when people introduce my friend Paul, that's what they say, and he's a lot more than that. Much time has passed. <laughs> We're not just Panthers and Revolutionaries anymore, but we still are on some levels. Welcome, Paul. Good to see you. Hey, Mark. Tremendous. <laughs> glad to be here with you. Really glad. So, uh, I, I really want, so this is the 40th anniversary of the Black Classic Press that you founded, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to take us back, and mm -hmm. I want to take us back to your passion for black people and people and justice, and how books tied into that, mm -hmm. and why you got in. You, you first started by starting a bookstore, right? Actually, uh, Mark, we started with the George Jackson prison movement. That's right. And that That's right. was right. because right. that was because in coming out of the Panthers, I was pretty much lost and uh, had no idea uh, what I was going to do with this political energy that had generated in the Panther Party, and also knew that I still had comrades who were incarcerated. And I'd spent a lot of time working with them and working with people who were in the jails across the country. And I wanted to do something in the jails and came back to Baltimore and got with, um, it was about five or six guys we were together. And we uh, argued all the time politically about everything, you know, because, you know, one of them was a ex Pan Africanist, one was an ex Marxist, the other one was an ex. I don't know. We and were you, all exes. You. I was an ex-Panther. You know? so, so, so we, we would philosophize about how the world and what we had to do for the workers and all this thing, and we never got anything done. I proposed <laughs> that we do a prison program, and everyone agreed on that. It's just that no one stuck around for it. Okay, so so the prison program worked in the sense that I ran it past Eddie Conway. We felt we could get books into the jail. We felt we could. Uh, conduct a program of educating people in the jail to come out of the jail to be uh, contributors in the community. That's that's what we saw. Uh, we saw uh, building a bookstore, we saw building a publishing house, and then building a printing company. And like I say, everyone said, thought that was a good idea, uh, but no one stuck around for it. <laughs> so I did, and another brother who was in the Panthers with me, Reginald Howard, did. Oh, yeah, right. And we right. started. Uh, the bookstore off of money that we pulled together. I drove a cab at the time, so I put my little bit of money in there. Uh, Reginald worked at, Howard Red worked down at Bethlehem Steel, and he put his money in there. And little by little, we were able to make that bookstore come along. It didn't work very well. Um, I ended up driving a cab more hours than I wanted to. <laughs> It was the going back itself, to school. It, it was it was actually on Pennsylvania Avenue, 1609 Pennsylvania Avenue. That address may be familiar to some people in Baltimore because that's where Shake and Bake is now. Right. That's the address right. of Shake and Bake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, I we, wonder if we, they know what roots they have. Look, 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 <laughs> Mark, Mark, we have that distinction. Right. But we also have the distinction of it's 2716, I believe, North Avenue is the location for the Coppin University. Um, it's a community, it's a building, they have classes there. That, when we moved off of North Avenue, we moved to 2716 North Avenue, and that's where Coppin now has a tremendous large facility yeah, yeah, yeah. dealing with yeah. social work and they've got an right. auditoriums in there and classrooms in there. Their front door is the exact front door of where the second bookstore was. You know, so when I look at it and I pass it, so look what, in some sense, look what you embryonically gave birth to. Isn't that something? I mean, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lucky numbers. <laughs> so from that started the George Jackson. George Jackson prison movement. We transitioned into. Uh, we set up the bookstore. The prison movement did not work. You know that fell off. But before it did, we we uh, became the Black Book, and uh, the Black Book was the name of the bookstore. From the Black Book, we transitioned uh, probably about four or five years later in 78, we opened up the publishing house, Black Classic Press. 
So uh, just for, to go backwards for a moment, not enough to go backwards, but to explain to some mm -hmm. of our viewers, I don't want to assume that everybody knows who George Jackson was. Sure, it's a good point. It's a good point. So, so George was a, you, you know, Mark, there, there are two mythic figures in the black liberation movement that we look at in the jails. There are more than two, but two mythic figures that stand above everyone else. And the first one is Malcolm X, and, and then you have George Jackson. And one of the reasons why they stand so large is because both of these men were largely self-educated and largely they were educated in the jails. So for us, we saw, and George had just been killed a year or so before we, right. we started our work, mm -hmm. but we, we saw George and Malcolm as being um, uh, redemp redemption signs and emblematic of, of, of redemption. And so naming a prison movement in his name was to assure that George would not be forgotten, would be to assure that the work he did in the jails would not be forgotten, and also to project a, um, an emblem, as I said, for folks to live into. He was able to transform himself and transform the people around him, and we felt that he did that through books. He did that through educating himself, and that's what we wanted to be a part so of. So in short, what happened? Why didn't that work? <clears throat> Well, it's actually in long, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> in long, <laughs> COINTEL was waiting for us. COINTEL Pro was there. They waiting. were waiting for us. <laughs> and, and it's true, working with the state of Maryland, they were able to block our getting books into the jail. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. But also something that we hadn't anticipated. We hadn't anticipated how um, the, um, among many of the brothers in jail, being as uh, forsaken as they are, being without what they are, books became a commodity. Uh -huh. And so those books, instead of being used as items to transform, they were used as items of exchange. Right. Now. I want a cigarette, I need this, that's I need right, that. So that's right, that's right, that's right. Now, now that wasn't the, f the that, that wasn't the end all and the be all, but we were in such fragile shape ourselves that it didn't look like that was the direction that we should go in at that time. And so we put our energies, and this is Reginald Howard and I, we put our energies into the black book, thinking that we could build an institution in the community that would service the community. Now, in addition to the black book, what, what happened was the Black Panther Party had left the city at that time. So one of the things that we did was we took over some of the connections that the Panthers had for procuring food, and we became a distribution center actually for the city providing food to people who ran out of food. We, we also, at the end of the month, people would run out of food before they got their food stamps and what have you. But we also uh, continued to function in a way that the Panther Party had functioned. Like people would some, still come to us for legal advice. They would come to us for rent, you know, help and assistance right, with right. their rent. I was looking back through some of the documents that, that uh, detailed how city agencies would send people to us. So we continued to do that work and we felt we could do it best through the bookstore as opposed to trying to do the work in the prison. So the, the roots of the Black Classic Press, I mean, this is, I mean, I, when I first learned about the Black Classic Press, I was just blown away by the idea of what it meant, what you were unearthing and bringing to the world. So this is, a, and the Black Classic Press was not something you walked into to make a, men, a mint to make money. This is something you were doing as it was a passion of yours yeah. to bring it out for everyone to understand yeah. Our, yeah. who we are as people. Absolutely. And, and you can understand it, and most people can understand it, uh, Mark. The, the press was founded to be a voice for the black community in the black community. And that was connected to the bookstore, the, the, the thinking of information. Well, it gave us a, a higher level of distribution of that information, more control of the information, and that's where the printing comes in. That's why the notion of being able to print that information that would go through the press and secure it that way was, was so important. But the, the, the bookstore and Black Classic Press and the printing company were all founded around the notion of voice. And it's, it's like it's one of the earliest things. If we can't speak for ourselves, if we can't declare what's important for ourselves. And Mark, in fact, the notion of, of black classic press is just that. 
it is black people saying what's classic. You understand? Right, I right. mean, if, 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 if you have the power to say what's classic, like I can't say what an Asian classic is. I can't even say what a white classic is, but I can declare what is a black classic. So what, let's describe that for people who are watching. Oh, what, sure. what do you mean that's, by black classic? That's beautiful. I, I, I'll give you a, 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 a short story. I'll try to contain it. I went away to library school, and, and while in library school, I was so meeting. Howard University? Uh, this, this would have been Atlanta University. Atlanta University. Uh, while, while there, when I first got there, we, we were having uh, lunch with a group of people, and there was a brother there. And, and this is a spoiler alert, you're probably going to have to edit this out, but I'm going to say it, okay? <laughs> so, so, so we were going around the table, and the brother said, you from Baltimore, man? He said, yeah, I'm from Baltimore. He said, what do you do? And I told him that I was there for library school, but I actually, you know, was publishing books. We'd only done a few books at this point. And he said, oh, wow, that's so powerful. And I told him we were going to do books that brought back the past. He said, that's so powerful, man. What's the name of your company? And I said, well, Black Classic Press. He said, Black Classic Press, damn, niggas got classics too. <laughs> now, Mark, when that man said that, when that man said that, he had the essence of what I was saying. Yeah, right, right. He was saying, right. I mean, he, he, he was, he was, he was making fun, but it's to say that white folks in our world are the only ones that have classics. It, it is white folks who control history. And for black folks to do that, he understood the significance and the importance of it. And when he did that, we all said, wow, okay. We did one of those things, but I knew that that was going to be the name. So classic is what, Mark, a classic is, is what people call classic. Classic is the most subjective term in the world. Right. I could call that cup a classic, and it is, as long as you and I agree that, right, right, that right. it is. So in uh -huh. terms of black classic, what I decided is that for me, what was classic and what was important to me and what I would offer to the world was those books that came before me those books that people bled into, those, those books that people actually gave their energy into to try to tell the story of black folks. Now, some of these books were written by black folks, some were written by white folks, but they all shared a common perspective that portrayed a humanity of people. And they were not, these people were not confused as they wrote these books. They understood that there was a universe outside of a white classic. There was a universe. And they were putting down their roots to be a part of that universe. My job was to continue the work that they had done before me. But well, part of your job, it seemed to me, was, which took some real work, I would imagine, would be unearthing literary works and books that people never heard of before. It, it didn't, that, that had been lost to time because who cared what black folks said? All, who all, cared, right? I mean, so I mean. You know, the, the thing about this, Mark, all of it's circular, so circular, because I didn't know anything about many of those books when we opened up the bookstore. It was people inside the jails who educated me. Really? Yes. Because they would send out notes to their mothers. They would send out notes to their brothers and they would say, um, do you know this book by this guy named uh, Ben Yakanami? Or, you know, they would mess up the names. Or, or uh, do you know this book by the guy A.J. Rogers? I didn't know who they were talking about. I'd have to research those books and, and research the books, find the books, which I did. They were talking about Yosef ben mm -hmm. and they were talking about J. Rogers. They were talking about John G. Jackson. And as I researched those books, I would go from book to book to book and find other things. The brothers in jail would send, they would send out from them, they said, well, look, this is not information that the white man wants us to have, you know? And what I found, Mark, so often on many of the books, of course, it had nothing to do with what white people wanted you to have. It dealt with the economics of it. Most often, those older books were developed by people who were putting the information out in largely to the interested black community. Well, there was a, a limit to that. There were distribution limits to it. There were no white publishers that were interested in these books back in the day. So almost all of them were self-published. And so many of the books became obscure, they became lost, not so much because 
uh, white folks were suppressing the books more because there wasn't a, a system of keeping those books alive and keeping those books in print. And again, that became the mission. It became, if, if you think about it, the knowledge and information that others had already done was available. All I had to do was go find it. Which was and not bring easy to do. Up. I mean, you're talking about unearthing books written not just the 20th century, 19th, 18th century, where people wrote books, didn't go to Random House to get them published. They wrote books. They wrote about their experiences, what life was seeing them, what they saw as what the world was about, what the black experience was in 1800, and then that book all of a sudden was there for a while, then poof, this it was is gone, a, This right? is an opportunity for stories today, Mark. Right. So I have a good friend, Walter Mosley, who you know. Yes. Okay, so people talk about Walter and say, well, it must be hard writing those books. <laughs> he, he says, I get up every day and I do it. I say, it must be hard doing that. And Walter said, think about it this way. If a beautiful woman <laughs> told you, if you get up in the morning and you just come over here and I got everything you want, <laughs> is that hard? <laughs> so he's speaking to his passion. You know, he's speaking to his passion. It wasn't hard. I mean, it may have been hard for somebody else, right, right. but it was my passion. I mean, it still is my passion. I, the, hard was the wrong word. I should say it's work. I it, mean, it's not even right? work, Mark, for me. It wasn't even work, and it's still not work now. Mark, it's like a, a sacred mission. You know, like, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, I, would read, mm -hmm. I would read books and get reference to another book. I gotta find that book, you know. It's, it's right. like it's like I gotta find it. I gotta have that, and then I would go from that book and mark the idea that people a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago understood what people don't understand today, and it didn't matter whether they had the whole story. They had enough of the significance of the story to to make it real. The idea that someone like Count Volney, who who was French would travel the world, would see black people in Africa, would see dark people in, in Syria, in, in, in the, what we now call the Middle East, would see that and come back and write a book like The Ruins of Empire, you know, in 1793, and he would talk he about- He was white or black? He, no, he, he, said he was white, he was white, he was, he was, he was uh, one of Napoleon's guys. Okay? Okay, okay. Right, right. <laughs> one of Napoleon's guys, and, be, and because the French then controlled that part, right. he was able to travel. And he was able to see and he was able to write and he was able to look at the world and understand from the ancient writings. And he would say things like, you know, the, you see these people here with this dark skin, frizzy hair, these people who you have lowered down, you know, they gave the world the arts, the sciences, the, the letters that we use today. Now, he wasn't so much on a, a bent of, of holding black folks up. What he was talking about was civilizations come and civilizations go. But he had the clarity, he had the clarity of mind right. to understand from what he was seeing, and he wasn't distorting what he had seen in the world. He brought that back, and of course, you know, that book was published in, in France and uh, around the world. When it was published in the United States, um, the forces of repression took that part out. <laughs> <laughs> did they really? Oh yeah, they took it out. And then he did a tour to the United States and the book didn't have it in it. He refused to have the book. He, he called the book out of print. You know, he, he what year, demanded. What, 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 late 1700s you're, you're talking about 1803 at this point. You're talking about 1803, okay, look. Which the Haitian Revolution was happening, people were terrified of the, yeah. the, the rise of, the, of, of, of a black republic, all but that was he, going on at the same time. And, and see, he wasn't. He wasn't in this sense. He wasn't in this sense. He wasn't really concerned about black folks as much as he was concerned that people understood the root of civilization. And if you're going to take this out, you're distorting what I'm saying. I mean, it literally, it literally cut his argument out because his argument was that black folks, you know, had some power. They contributed to civilization at some point, but they passed from civilization. Your job is to ensure that civilization goes on. That's what he was telling to folks around the world. And your job is to ensure that we understand that this took place. Yeah, you got to remember that. You got to remember that. At least I think it's important for me to be in that role, and that's what I thought when the press was founded. We're here on The Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner, and I'm talking with Paul Coates, founder of the Black Classic Press. This is part one of our interview. Part two will be coming. <laughs>